Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tibedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the living organisms. So far what we have discussed in the previous module, we have discussed about the classification of the different organisms. And while we were discussing about the classifications, we have discussed about the invertebrate animals and we have also discussed about the vertebrate animals. Apart from that, while we were discussing about the classifications, we have discussed about the different way in which the organisms are being classified. And we have seen that the animals are being classified as the, you know, within the five different kingdoms. These kingdoms are the protesta, monera, fungi, animalia and plants. And to understand how the people are doing the classifications, we have also, we have discussed in detail about the invertebrate classification as well as the vertebrate classification. And ultimately in the previous lecture, we have also discussed about the plant classifications. And why we were discussing these classifications? We were discussing these classifications only to understand that how the different organisms are interrelated to each other, how they are being you know, uh, evolved from the uh, lower organisms. So you might have seen that there are many organisms which were gradually acquiring the new and new characters and that's how they were actually developing the, you know, the new features. For example, when we were discussing about the different types of mammals, we discussed that how the mammals have actually evolved their uh, heart. Like, so initially the heart was one chambered heart and then it was become two chambered heart and then it becomes the four chambered heart which is actually the fully developed heart which is present in the very very high mammals like the humans so while we were why we were discussing about the classifications we were discussing the classifications to understand how these living organisms are interrelated to each other and how they are forming a relationships and how these relationships could be exploited in terms of understanding many features so in today's lecture we are going to discuss about the evolutions or how these organisms are being evolved so to understand these aspects first we have to understand that how the life actually originated onto the earth because you have to first understand how the life originated on the earth and then you can actually be able to understand how these life uh, containing organisms are actually being you know acquired the characters acquired the features so that they will be able to adapt more nicely and they will be able to run their a life cycle in a smooth way. So the first question which we would like to ask or which we would like to raise today is what is life and how you define the life. So what is life? So life is defined as the ability of an organism to reproduce energy through chemical reactions to utilize the outside material. So what it mean is that you can say that an organism is having a life if the organism could be able to reproduce which means it can be able to give you the offsprings right it could be able to utilize the raw material whether the raw material would be in the case of plant for example it could be a sunlight right or if it could be the other organisms like the plant itself could be a raw material for the other organisms like as we discussed in the previous lecture or previous module that the uh, you know some plants some organisms are the 
herbivoras and some organisms are the carnivora. But irrespective of that, the life is going to be defined as the ability of an organism to reproduce, which means it can be able to give rise to the offsprings. Then it can also be able to grow, which means it can actually be able to grow in size. Like for example, when we born, we are born as a child, right? Then slowly, slowly, slowly we uh, we grow in terms of height, in terms of our hands are big, so we become adult, right? So that also should be the there. And then it should be able to produce energy. So it should be able to run the metabolic reactions so that it can be able to utilize the raw material what is available in the system, right? So if it is a plant, the plant will actually be able to utilize the two raw material. It is can be utilized the carbon dioxide and the you know water so the carbon dioxide and water are actually going to be utilized by the plant along with the sunlight right and that's how the plants are actually going to generate the food which is going to be consumed by the other organisms right so before we get into the details of how the life is originated onto the earth the scientists as well as the philosophers have tried to understand the two important questions related to life. First is how the life originated onto the earth because this which looks very simple with the uh, you know easy way that okay you have an organism it is utilizing and all that but the first question is that how the organism have evolved an ability to do that and that we should be able to understand. So the first question is that how life originated onto the earth and the second question is once the life originated onto the earth how it has actually acquired the different types of features like so how the different kinds of organisms are being formed you know that we have many types of invertebrate organisms we have different types of vertebrate organisms we have plants we have the fungi we have different types of bacteria we have viruses we have viroids we have mycoplasma so how these different types of organisms which we have discussed in the previous module are being developed onto the earth right how these organisms the different organisms are being developed so these are the two different important questions which we are going to discuss in this particular modules so let's start how the life originated onto earth and if we want to understand the life we have to first understand how the earth is being formed onto the how the earth is formed and how why the life is also pre only present onto the earth if you recall and if you go through with the different types of uh, you know newspapers and all those kind of sources what you will find is that the earth is the only planet in the solar system where you have the life there are uh, other planets which are bigger than the earth but they don't have the life so we first have to understand how the life is originated what will be unique about the earth so that the life is only originated onto the earth and uh, you know what are the different conditions which are actually allowing the life to be originated onto earth so to understand these questions we are going to ask how the earth is formed and why there is a life onto the earth so first question is how the earth is formed and how its internal structures are supporting the life Evidences suggest that the earth and the other planet in the solar system came to existence about 4.5 to 5 billion years ago, right? And earth originally had two components. One is the solid mass like the earth, right? Which is also called as the lithosphere and the surrounding gaseous envelope, which is called as the atmosphere, right? You know all this, right? That you have the two major component one is the solid mass which is called as the lithosphere and commonly it says it's as the you know uh, surface right and the atmosphere right the air around that so once the temperature of the primitive earth cooled down below 2000 degrees celsius uh, then the liquid component also came which is also called as the hydrosphere so you have the three components one is the lithosphere which is actually the solid mass you have the air part which is called as the atmosphere and then you have the water part which is called as the hydrosphere now if you see the structure of an earth what you will see is that the earth has the 
different layers and these layers are as follows you have the barospheres you have the pyrospheres and you have the lithospheres so this is i am talking about the solid mass which you are talking about right so you have the barospheres so it is the central core of the earth so this is the barosphere which is the central core of the earth and it is filled with a molten magna with a large quantity of iron and nickel so this is the central part which is called as the barospheres and it is actually being filled with the minerals like the iron as well as the uh, you know iron as well as the nickel and this is the only portion which actually comes out from the earth in the form of when there will be you know volcano eruption so then this portion comes out from the earth in the form of uh, uh, the lava right and that's how the it actually you know uh, it is very hot and because this is the portion which is very very you know having a molten uh, these metals right so these metals once they comes out in the form of you know the fountain or in the form of the lava they becomes you know they destroy the regions the barospheres has two zone the inner core zone so this is the inner core zone where you have actually the iron and the nickel and that is what is called as the inner core so you have the inner core and then you also have the outer core okay in the inner core you have the solid nickel and the iron so in the inner core you have the solid metals like the iron and the nickel whereas in the outer core you have the liquid metals like the liquid iron why it is so because the inner core has a temp has the very high temp uh, is a high temperature at 340 uh, 3400 degrees celsius whereas the inner core has a temperature at 4300 degrees celsius and it also increase the pressure changes it to the solid phase so inner core has a radius of the 800 miles whereas the outer core has a radius of the 1400 miles radius right and uh, apart from that then you have the middle layer which is middle layer is also is called as the pyrosphere so it is the middle part of the earth also known as the mantle so this is uh, called as the mantle so this is like a, a plastic like behavior because it has uh, at the temperature of 1000 to 3000 degrees celsius and it mostly contains the silica magnesium and iron aluminium and calcium and it is 1800 miles in thickness and mainly consists of silica manganese and magnesium so this is also a you know the place which is filled with the different types of uh, metals and uh, mostly these metals are uh, you know the silica manganese and magnesium so you know that the silica is actually a main component which is forming the soil right uh, and then you have the lithosphere so lithosphere is the outermost region of the earth also known as the crust so this is the lithosphere which is also called as the crust and it is 20 to 25 miles in thickness and mainly has silica and the aluminium so if you recall these are the three layers you have the barospheres which is the innermost layer barosphere has two regions one is called as the inner core where you have the solid metals like the iron and the nickel then you have the outer core which also which contains the liquid iron and that liquid iron only comes out in the form of the lava when there will be a volcano eruptions and then you have the middle layer which is also called as the pyrospheres and this middle layer is also uh, consist of the silica manganese iron aluminium and calcium and then you have the itos, uh, outer layer which is called as the crust or the lithosphere and that is also containing the silica and aluminium so this is the structure of the earth outside you have the atmosphere right so outside you also has the atmosphere and you also has the hydrosphere right so this is what you have which actually be present around the earth now how this actually can make earth as a suitable planet for developing the earth uh, developing the life right so what will be the what will be the requirement of a planet 
to give the life. So, that is what you have to understand and these are the prerequisites which are present on the earth. So, there are multiple conditions which were existing on the earth to support the life on the earth. These are as follows. So, in the primitive earth, there was low or the little oxygen present, which means the earth's primitive environment was the uh, reducing environment, which means it, never, it was not containing the oxygen. So, there was no oxygen in the primitive uh, earth. The earth originally had a reducing environment due to the presence of hydrogen as well as the hydrogen compounds such as the methane and the ammonia. Even if it contains the water that does not contain the oxygen, it is a compound where the oxygen is coupled with the hydrogen. So, due to gravitational forces, these gases remain within the atmosphere of the primitive earth. So, that is the second point. Why there is a atmosphere in the earth? Because it has the gravitational forces and because of the gravitational forces, it actually pulls all these gases or it actually keeps a pressure on these gases and because of that, these gases are always being remain within the atmosphere and because they will remain in the atmosphere, they will be able to interact with each other and that is how they are actually going to give rise to different types of compounds. So, the reducing environment of the primitive earth will help to synthesize the organic compound from the interaction of the inorganic substances. So, because they, it has the gravitational forces, because it has the um, reducing environment, you know the advantage of reducing environment. If you have a reducing environment, the reducing environment actually uh, you know, pr reduce the reduce the uh, chances of spoiling of the substances. For example, if you have a sugar molecule, and if you keep the sugar molecule as such, the sugar is actually going to get oxidized, right? Uh, spontaneously, even if you keep a sugar molecule and you don't do anything, it is actually going to get oxidized because there is a oxygen in the environment and that is how it is actually going to form the carbon dioxide and water. Maybe there are microorganisms which are actually going to do this because if the microorganisms are going to do this, it, this, this process is going to be very fast and that is how what will happen is that the sugar which is a complex uh, organic molecule is going to be broken down into the carbon dioxide and water and that is how you are actually going to destroy the formed organic molecules. Whereas, if it is a reducing environment, you cannot break the sugar molecule, it will remain as such and that is how you can be able to utilize this sugar molecule or you can be able to then build the bigger molecule based on this sugar molecule. So, that is why that was the major reason why the life is originated onto the earth because it has a reducing environment and then it also has the gravitational forces to hold the gases within the atmosphere of the primitive gas. So, what are the organic material what you have? You have water, you have methane, you have ammonia and you have all these molecules, all these are in the present of the gases because the temperature of the earth or the temperature of the primitive earth is approximately around 1000 degrees Celsius. So, that it always keeps water not in the liquidified form that always keeps the water in the vapor form and that is how the water actually can interact with the methane, ammonia and that is how it can actually be able to give you the organic compounds. Then it also has the essential inorganic materials, right? So, inorganic material in the earth interact to form the organic material required to produce the life. For example, we have just discussed, right, in the previous uh, slide that we have the, you know, we have the iron, we have the aluminium, we have the silica, we have the, you know, uh, nickel and all these metals, apart from these metal, we also have the, you know, water which is very, very important for the life, right? You might have seen, right? If you keep uh, water in a, in a bucket or somewhere and if you leave it like that undisturbed, you will see that the algae and all other kinds of live organisms originates, right? So, that is actually the power of the water, right? So, because it allows the growth, it allows the growth of the living organisms. Then you also have the um, methane, you have the ammonia, right? And all these are very, very essential for generation of the uh, complex organic molecules. 
then it also requires the energy source. So, the energy source on the primitive earth comes from the multiple sources you have the solar radiations. So, we are very lucky and we are very blessed that we have a you know a, a, a very big source of energy in the form of sun right. Then we have the electric discharge. So, these are electric discharge will come when there will be a lightning. Then we have the you know volcanic eruptions. So, volcanic eruptions I think just we in the previous slide only we have discussed that if there will be a volcanic eruptions it gives rise to the you know the, it 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 come allows the in the coming out of the the uh, magna and it coming out of the lava right so around with the lava it also gives the energy then it also has the heat so heat also comes from the uh, solar uh, power and then you have also have the cosmic rays and then you also have the radioactive material which actually going to decay and that is how you are actually also going to provide the energy into the system. Because you cannot catalyze these reactions under the normal circumstances or at a very very low temperature right. So, you always require the energy if you want to uh, form the complex molecules. And then there was a no the full last point is the infin infinite time right. As per the estimate, it took approximately 1 billion year from the formation of earth to appearance of the life. Such a long time is needed for the chemical reactions. Why it is so? Because currently if you try to do the chemical reactions, what you are going to do? Suppose I want to convert a A into B, right? So, what I will do is I will just put an enzyme and I will put the cofactors, right? I will put some and when I, once I put the enzyme, the A is going to be get converted in the range of milliseconds or seconds actually. But since the enzyme were not present onto the primitive earth, because enzymes are biological catalysts, they can actually be able to enhance the rate of reactions, right? And that is how the A will get converted into a, at a rapid rate. But since the enzyme were not present onto the uh, primitive earth, these reactions are going to be very, very slow, right? They will take minutes, seconds, and hours for completing, uh, you know, the even the single condensation reactions of hydrogen and oxygen to give you the water, right? And that's why it took so, a very, very long time even for formation of Earth. And on the other hand, it also took very long time for these chemical reactions to give rise to the simpler organic molecules like sugar and the carbohydrates. So, these are the prerequisite of the life on the earth, but there was still we have the uh, you know the original question left that how the life originated onto earth. To understand that question, the people in the different eras actually uh, you know proposed the different types of hypothesis or different types of theories to explain that. So, what are these theories? These old theories were mainly based on to the experimental basis or the assumption based, right? So, there are six major theories which are being proposed or ex to explain the origin of life on the earth. These theories are as follows. So, you have the theory of special creations. So, the most of the religious uh, uh, bodies or most of the religion actually believes that the God or Bhagwan or whatever is actually the creator of the earth and the different organisms. This theory was completely been based on the uh, trust as well as the belief and there was no experiment. So, no experimental evidence that you are God has created the earth right or God has created the organisms. Then we have the theory of spontaneous generations. So, theory of spontaneous generation believes or hypothesized and there were a couple of scientists who believe that the non-living matter give rise to the living organisms. And then we have the theory of catastrophisms. So, theory of catastrophism is also very similar to the theory of special creations. Uh, it also believes that the life is originated by the God and then the there are catastrophes and uh, because of that the uh, some, some organisms are now vanished and so on. So, that is how it actually are uh, very much close to the this and there was no experimental evidences. So, there was no experimental evidences that it is actually been happening. 
Then we have the theory of cosmozoics. So theory of cosmozoic, the scientists who were supporting the theory of cosmozoic believe that the life on the earth comes from the other planet. But the main questions remain the unanswered. Even if the life is uh, comes on the earth from the other planet, how the life originated on that planet? So that question is also not been answered and this theory is also is just been proposed without having any experimental. Then we have a theory of eternity. So theory of eternity is like a life has no beginning or the end, which means life is a continuous process. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot be originated. So why we are raising this question that how the life originated on the earth. So the theory of eternity of life is completely, uh, you know, non-experimental and non-scientific. And then we have the modern theory of uh, origin of life, which actually is also called as the chemical theory, where people believe that the chemical molecule gives rise to the generation of organism. And this theory is completely being dependent or completely being uh, based on the experiments, what has been uh, done by the Millet and Urey. Okay. So let's start discussing each and every theory and how the why the people have not accepted these theories. So the first theory is the theory of special creations. The theory of special creation is proposed that the life on earth is created by a superpower, the God. So Every religion has its own uh, way of explaining this process. The, some people said that the, the God took uh, seven days actually to create different organisms and so on. And then uh, so, uh, so and every religion has its own belief. So according to the Christian belief, the God has created the universe, planets, animals, plants and human in the six natural days. Similar beliefs are also being proposed by the other religion as well. So there are Hindu religion which also has proposed a similar kind of uh, things and uh, all these are mostly being non-experimental. They were not being uh, based on the any kind of experiments. They were all believed. They were all based on the, uh, you know, the belief theories. Okay. So there are beliefs in the theory of special creations, but these are the point which are being, you know, uh, proposed by this theory and then there are the contradictions. What it's been says is that all living organisms were created on the same day because if it is created by the God, it can actually be created by the same day, right? But if they are being created on the same day, there should be no difference in their appearances. And we all know that there is a gradual decrease or gradual appearances of these animals, right? Because when we do the fossil data, if you go by the fossil data, what you will see is that the fossil is actually going to tell you the age of that particular animal or by that particular organisms and the ages of the different organism, how they appeared on the earth is also very, very different. So that's actually is not going to be applicable. Whereas the theory says that all living organisms were created same day by the God, right? Then the second is they were created in the present form, which means they are being created in the fully developed form as what you see today. If that is the case, there should be no evolution. But we know that there are evolutionary markers what are present onto the different organisms, right? You have the vestigial organs, you have the other form of evidences that there is a evolution. There is a evolution through which the organisms are being evolved from the one form to another form. So this is also not being acceptable or not being proved conclusively. And then they say that their bodies and organs are fully developed to meet the requirement to run the life cycle. That means there should be no adaptation, but that is also not true, right? Uh, there is a adaptation, there is a adaptation um, in the every organisms and that's how it actually gives rise to the different organisms. So all the these three points which were being part of this particular theory are not being found to be true. Apart from that, there were a series of objections to this particular theory of special creations. What is the number one? So number one was the major objection. It was purely believed on the religious belief. It was purely based on the religious belief. Then the second point was 
there was no experimental evidences to support the assumptions so there was see when you do an ex when you do a, a try to you know sort out a problem you are first going to do a hypothesis right so uh, you are going to first generate a hypothesis then this hypothesis has to be tested by doing the series of experiments and then these experimenters have to analyze right so this was the scientific way of sorting out a problem right and once you analyze then you are actually going to refine your hypothesis but in this case there was hypothesis there was hypothesis that god has created the earth and the other planet as well as the animals plants and all that but there was no experiments there was no analysis of those experiments and there was no further things right so the with since this theory was based on a non experimental basis the most of the scientists have discarded this theory and the third objection was that the age of the different fossil proven that the living organism appear on earth in different time frame which means they was not been created in 6 days because if they are been created in 6 days uh, you are not going to see the change or difference between the different organisms so because of this the theory of special creation are is not been acceptable or it was not been able to explain the uh, how the life originated on the earth then we have the second theory the second theory was the theory of spontaneous generations so this theory is also called as theory of abiogenesis so according to this theory the non living matter give rise to the different organisms the theory of spontaneous generation or the abiogenesis assumes that the non living material in a spontaneous manner give rise to life these are several observations supporting this theory which are as follows so there are observations there was observation by the scientists or the common people that people have put together and then propose this particular theory which says that the the living organisms are been evolved from the non living organic or chemical molecules by a spontaneous manner which means there was no uh, god involved in this or there was no other in, uh, factors involved so the first thing was that people have dipped the hair of horse tail in the water so if you take the horse and if you dip the horse tail into the water what they have found is that the, it has given rise to the horse hair worm which is also called as the gordius so that was the first evidence then the second was that if you have a rotten meat and if you left the rotten meat on you know a rotten meat as such then what you will see is that the fly larva is actually going to be developed on that so this means the rotten meat given rise to flies right similarly the this uh, horse tail which is actually uh, you know horse tail is made up of like keratin right so a horse tail is also keratin so which is also a uh, you know the uh, the non living material right because it is hair right and that also give rise to this particular uh, worm right then the third observation was that in the ancient egypt the people believed that it was in the nile river if it is nile river is you know warm with the sun then that give rise to spontaneously the development of frogs snakes and as well as the crocodile so it was spontaneous right so people have observed that if there is a sun on to the nile river it actually give rise to the different types of animals like frogs snakes and crocodiles and then ultimately the one scientist which is called as the von helmont that he has done an experiment as well so what he has done is he took uh, you know a, a dirty shirts and it has taken a handful of wheat grain and then he has kept those things right so it has who, who took the uh, wheat grains uh, or the barley uh, you know so, and he took the shirt right so he took the shirt and he put it into a cupboard uh, and that cupboard he, he closed that cupboard for 3 weeks okay what he could found is that this cupboard has actually developed the mice at the end okay but he could not be able to explain how the mice are been developed or 
even a um, majority of these things uh, they, they could not be able to explain why only this particular worm is been developed or why the flies were developed onto the rotten meat and so on. So, then the people have started developing or accruing the evidences which will actually going to disprove. So, there are evidences which are being proved uh, against the theory of spontaneous generation. So, the theory of spontaneous generation was criticized by the three scientists the Spallanzani, Francisco Reddy and the Louis Pasteur and these great scientists performed the well designed scientific experiments to disprove the theory of spontaneous generations. So, they have see these people have not done any experiment they were only proposed the hypothesis and they and the all these hypotheses were based on the observation. So, there was no experiment except that the von Helmont probably has done a very very crude experiment. Uh, where you know he has just kept the dirty shirt and a handful of wheat grains and he found that after 21 days there is a development of mice. But what he has not done is he has not done any kind of control experiment, he has not done any kind of other kind of things. So, to disprove this theory or to test this theory actually these three scientists have done the very meticulously scientific experiments. So, let us see that those experiments. So, the first experiment is being done by the Francisco Reddy. Francisco Reddy uh, did a conclusive and well defined experiment to disprove the theory of spontaneous generation. What he has done is he has took the three jar. What he has done is he has taken a rotten meat. Okay, He boiled that meat and so that it becomes soft and then it gets rotten. right? So, he took the three jars. One, he took the meat into three jars and then he kept the one jar open. The second jar he has put a gauze. Um, gauze is a cloth actually which actually has the net on that right. You might have seen the gauze which people use for uh, uh, pe uh, causing the bandage okay, to the wound or something. So, this gauze is actually having a will not allow the uh, bigger animals or flies to get inside but it can actually be able to allow the you know the smell or other kind of things to come out. Okay? So, then the second jar he has closed with a gauge and the third jar he has closed with a parchment which means it has actually clawed, closed completely. So, neither the smell can come out nor the animals or the, uh, the flies can actually go inside. So, what he has done is he took the three jars, the jar one was left open so that the any animal or anything can actually be able to go inside. Then jar two was covered with the gauge as I said you know gauge is having a net. So, it actually can uh, will not allow the flies to get inside but it can actually be able to allow the smell and other things to come out. Then the third jar it was covered with a parchment or the paper. The meat and the fishes decayed in all the three jars and it attracted the fish. So, what happened in the jar number one? So, first see that. So, what happened is in the jar one where the smell as well as the and smell came out right from this uh, rotten meat as well as the fishes. So, as a result the flies came right. So, flies came from outside and that is how the flies are actually given the uh, their babies or the maggots. And that is how the it has proved. So, the first experiment actually proved that the uh, chemical molecules or the rotten meats has or the non living material has given rise to the life. Then the second object, second jar he has put it uh, as a muslin cloth or the gauge right. So, gauge actually is if doing something. So, what he has done it, it, uh, it attracted the flies, but the flies cannot get inside right. So, even if the you have the you know, organic material inside it cannot give rise to a you know maggots and all those kind of things. But instead these flies because they are attracted onto the top surface they have given the maggots onto the surface of this particular uh, paper or paper uh, cloth right. Then in the jar 3 which was conclusive that what uh, which cannot actually give rise to the smell or it cannot attract the flies. So, if there is no flies what he could found is that the, there was no development of maggots. So, this actually proves that the theory of abiogenesis is not true. It actually 
the pre-existing molecules or pre-existing organism which are giving rise to the new organisms. Whereas, you see the in the jar 3, when it is closed completely, it is not giving rise to any fly. So, in the jar 1, the flies enters and layered egg which eventually give rise to the new larva. So, that is the theory of abiogenesis, right? Whereas, in the jar 2, the flies could not be able to enter and no larva was found inside the jar. So, that was a disproof or dis, uh, you know, contradictions to the uh, theory of abiogenesis, but the flies laid egg on the gauze to produce the larva and that is actually the point which the Reddy was trying to prove that it is the fly which actually give rise to the maggot. It is not the meat which give rise to the maggots actually. And this was conclusively proved that the organisms arise from the pre-existing organism rather than the non-living matters. Okay? Now, to make it more conclusive, this uh, the other experiment is also been proved by this Palangeli and he also done the similar kind of experiments. So, what he has done, he has actually took the two type of uh, round bottom flask. So, he took the two flask, then the he has took the meat broth and he boiled the meat broth okay? and then he allowed that broth to be cooled down. Okay? So, once it cooled down and he left the flask open, so he also took the two flasks, one is the flask which where he has uh, you know uh, let, let it be remain open, the other one he has closed. Okay? So, in the designed experiment to test the validity of theory of spontaneous generation, in this experiment Spallanzani has prepared animal or the vegetable broth and boiled them for several hours and then either remained open or sealed immediately. These broths remained free from the microorganism growth. Right? He concluded that high temperature boiling had killed all the microorganism and in the absence of microorganisms life could not appear. The broth left open or exposing of the sealed broth shows the growth of the microorganism. So, what he has done is he took the two uh, flasks, he boiled the vegetable or the meat broth for several hours so that there will be, if there will be any microorganism which is present inside this broth should be get killed. So, there should be no pre-existing broth. And then what he has done is he has kept the broth open or the flask open and then he allowed the broth to be cooled down. So, after some time when he waited for the you know few days or few weeks, what he could found is there will be a growth of microorganisms. Similarly, he has done the same way, but this time what he has done is he has flask, he has sealed the flask while when it was hot actually. So, because of that there will be no entry of microorganisms from outside and that is how this flask remains uh, you know without growth. But what happened is as soon as so, it, he, uh, he that demonstrated that the for, for the appearance of the microorganisms, you require an external source. So, to prove that what he has done is he opened the flask for some days and what he could found is that there is a growth of microorganisms. Now, the major objection to the Reddy's experiment or to the Spallanzani experiment came because both of these experiments were not allowing one major component. One major component is air, right? So, it was not allowing the entry of air. So, the scientists who were the supporter of the theory of abiogenesis or the theory of spontaneous generation say that you have actually come, you know, you have destroyed or you did, you abolished the entry of air and because of that, the life is not been originated into these flasks because air is a very, very important component of the, for the living organisms and that is how you are actually this experiment does not prove. So, to prove this particular point, the Louis Pasteur has also done a similar kind of experiment. So, what he has done is the Louis Pasteur has used a, 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 a S color uh, uh, flask. Okay? So, what he has done is uh, he has actually, uh, so in an another conclusive experiment, uh, the Louis Pasteur had designed an experiment in a flask with a S-shaped curved tube. So, what he has done is he took a S-shaped curved tube and he has done what he has done, he has boiled the broth. So, 
he took the hay infusion in the flask and boiled for several minutes or the hour after cooling the steam condenses into the lower part of the tube and act as a barrier to stop the entry of microorganism so what happen is he has boiled the broth and then the broth actually the vapors are coming and going right but when he has stopped the heating the broth actually got condensed in this particular portion right so it go, uh, the, there was a layer of water which is been formed here so because of that it does not allow the entry of microorganism so you are actually have the two component one the entry of microorganism the other is the entry of air but the, it does not have any any kind of interference in terms of entry of oxygen so it, it allows the oxygen entry of oxygen and then he allowed this uh, flask to be remain open for several days and he could not found any growth so because why it is so because this particular portion was uh, you know causing a barrier to the entry of microorganisms but once he has broken this particular s shape knob and it allowed the entry of microorganisms he, what he could found is that there is a growth of the microorganisms so no life appeared in the flask for several months okay analysis of the condensed water indicate the appearance of the microorganism in the neck of the tube so what he has done is he took out this water and then he he, he done the analysis he, what he could found is there are many type of microorganism but they could not go and because of that there is no growth for even for several months but when he has broken the neck and did not uh, the, remove this s tube from the uh, flask the microorganism got the chance to enter into the flask and they have shown the growth uh, because of this particular type of phenomena the uh, lew pasteur has conclusively disproved the theory of abiogenesis or theory of spontaneous generation and big, and all these three experiments has proved that the life is not been generated from the non living forms now the third is uh, the second theory is that the next theory is the theory of catastrophism so it is similar to the theory of special creations this is the exist extension of the theory of special creation this theory assumed that the life is originated by the creation and it is followed by the catastrophes due to the geographical disturbance each catastrophe destroyed the life completely whereas each creation forms life remain different from the previous one hence each round of catastrophe or creation is responsible for the involvement of the different types of organism on the earth so what this theory says there is there is a creation uh, portion so there is a creation and there is a destruction okay destruction because of the different types of Uh, natural calamities like uh, volcanic eruptions the lightning the the earthquake and all those kind of things so that actually is going to destroy the organism and there is a creation so th that creation is going to be done by the god and that is actually going to put the organism and because of that the different organisms are being appeared on to the earth and that's why the we have the different types of organisms the objection of this particular current theory is same as the previous one right no scientific experiment is there to support the hypothesis and mostly it is a imaginary concept so that's why the people don't believe that there is a theory of catastrophism then the second theory is the theory of cosmozoic so theory of cosmozoic believes that the life on the earth comes from the other planet this theory was put forward by the scientist called richard richarter and it was strongly been supported by another scientist which is called as the arrhenius the theory assumes that the life was present in uh, was present in the form of resistance force and appeared onto the earth from the other planet since the condition of earth was supporting the life these spores grew and evolved into the different organisms which means this theory says there are spores which appe which was fall onto the earth and they were coming from the other planet and that's how they have given the 
appearance of the different types of organisms and that ha could happen at the different era so that's how they, they we have a different types of organisms this theory was also known as the theory of the panospermia or the sperm theory the theory initially got the support from the fact that the fossil of the microorganisms were found in the metroids in the 1961 so this theory initially got the support because they were you know there were fossils which were found in the metroids but no mechanism is known about the transfer of spore from the other planet or whether these spores could survive the journey in the space you know that the space is actually having a very very uh, non living non life supporting conditions so if that is the case how these spores were viable while they were traveling from the another planet to the earth and the absence of life form on any other planet except earth is actually uh, um, you know ex uh, uh, is not giving any detail about the spores its origin and the mechanism of crossing the interplanetary space and the reaching of the earth in addition this theory does not add much into the fundamental detail about the origin of life because what it says is the life forms come from the other planet and that's how it been actually been developed onto the earth but what it does not give the fundamental question is how the life originated on that particular planet right so and on the, apart from that they have there were no experiments which were supporting this particular theory so as a result the hypothesis did not receive the much attention although this theory was very very you know attractive it will you know it was you know going to solve the problem that okay the spores came from the other planet and that's how they we have the earth on we have the life on the earth but it does not uh, give any insight into the major question that how the life is originated onto the onto the that particular planet as well so how the life forms formed onto the any planet is been not been uh, addressed by this particular theory then we have the another theory which is called as the theory of eternity of life so this theory believes that the life has no beginning or to the end which is very very funny and the interesting assumption so this theory assume that life had no beginning on the end right it believes that life has a life that life has ever been existence and it will continue to be so far so life is like you cannot destroy the life and it cannot be originated so that's there's no question of raising this uh, you know question that how the life originated on the earth so it further believed that there is no question of origin of life right it has no beginning or the end so this theory is also known as the steady state theory which means it says that life is a uh, you know uh, cannot be created cannot be destroyed okay and uh, and that's how this theory is also called as theory of eternity of life or the steady state theory the main objection against the pepper's theory is that it could not be able to explain evidences supporting that the initial earth forms and then the life appeared on the earth whereas life exists before the formation of the earth right so this this theory does not ex be able to explain many of the of these objections so we have discussed uh, the uh, five major theories we have discussed about the theory of special creations we discussed about the theory of spontaneous generations we discussed about the theory of catabolisms we have discussed about the theory of cosmozoic and we have discussed about the theory of eternity of life what we have discussed what we have understood from these theory is that we have discussed so far about the five theories that the life is originated so for example the theory of special creation that the theory of special creation says that the god is the creator of the earth and the other organism and all these organisms are appeared on the same day on the earth but we know that all these things are assumptions are wrong most of the these theories were based on the without conducting any experiments so and that was the major issues right even if the experiments were done like for example the experiments were done by the reddies or spelgelli or the liu pasteur these experiments were done only to disprove the theory of abiogenesis rather than providing any kind of evidences to support the evidences even if the evidences were been uh, given for the theory of abiogenesis like the generation of the 
different types of animals in the Nile River or the development of the worms in the when you dip the uh, the, uh, the horse tail or when you keep the you know the wheat with the uh, dirty shirt uh, it actually give rise to the different types of mice all these evidences are superficial they were not very well defined scientific evidences and they were not scientific experiments right to disprove or prove these particular theories although the reddy's experiment spelgeli experiments or the louis pasteur experiment clearly disprove that there is a the theory of abiogenesis is not uh, you know applicable or not been able to explain completely the uh, origin of life on the earth so with this uh, we are going to conclude for today's lecture in the next lecture we are going to discuss about the modern theory of uh, modern theory uh, origin of life which is also called as the chemical theory and uh, in that uh, lecture we are going to see the well defined experiments and how the life could be developed onto the earth so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here thank you